What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. It's time for a recap of Teen Mom 2 Season 8 Episode 24. This episode starts off with Kale talking to her producer about how she feels really badly burned by relationships and she's nervous about men. This is a conversation about her bisexuality and she's like, I'm leaning more towards women right now because Chris burnt me so bad that I don't trust men and I just don't feel okay with dating men. Which is quite ironic because I'm pretty sure damn near everybody this woman has dated and subsequently cheated on can say the same thing. In the next scene over we see her and her friend Lindsay shooting a podcast that they do together and she talks about worrying about having a major age gap between her children and she also talks about wanting to have a fourth child for whatever reason and she wants it soon because she doesn't want a too big of an age gap between Isaac and that child. Guys I really wonder why these teen moms just want to continuously pump out babies. It's like they don't realize that the gravy train is going to come to an end and kids are only going to get more expensive as they age. Over in Florida, Brianna FaceTimes her friend to talk about having to choose out daycares for her super young daughter. I'm always like forgetting how different maternity leave is like around the world. Here in Canada, like you are not leaving a child that young to go back to work. Thank God, like you have at least a year here. So anyway, for some reason, looking at daycares is a family affair that has to involve her mother and her sister as well. I don't know why she couldn't have just done it herself or with Louis, uh, with Louis as well, you know, considering he was in town for this. And so, of course, after the whole entire family decides to look at a daycare for Stella, they all have to go out to lunch together as well. And her mom just grills Louis on everything, like his career, um, his communication with his daughter and all of that. It was very interesting to me how last season the issue was that he didn't have a job. And now the issue is that he does have a job. It's like, OK, which is it here, you guys? Um, Something that rubbed me the wrong way about Lewis was that he complained when Brianna was like, you don't even check up on your daughter that often. So like, what's going on? He's like, oh, I suck at communicating. No, you don't suck at communicating. You just don't care about your daughter that much. There are so many people in my phone book that I don't text back as often as I text back the people that I really do want to talk to. Like if my mom texts me, my sister texts me, my best friends text me or my man texts me, I get back to them ASAP because those are people that I really want to talk to. But then there's a whole host of other people that you kind of know or you're kind of friendly with or whatever, where it's like, all right, I'll get back to you in like three to five business days. And that's the way Lewis looks at his own child. I don't think that anybody ever just sucks at communicating, especially not when it comes to their damn child, especially, especially when it comes to their child who has a heart condition. Really, Lewis? really do better. Meanwhile in West Virginia, Leah talks to her sister about um, venues for the twins' upcoming birthday parties. We saw earlier that Corey had a birthday party for the kids at a community center and now Leah wanted to plan her own. And she was complaining to her sister about how Gracie chose of the options that Leah had already narrowed down for them. Leah was the one who chose some options that were not fully accessible for Allie. And for some reason, she's complaining that those are the ones that Gracie gravitated to towards. Well, if you didn't choose them in the first place, they wouldn't have been options for Gracie. So I don't know where that frustration was coming for, uh, from because that was her fault in the first place. Back in Delaware, again, it turns out that Chris filed for emergency visitation rights over his son, Lux. And Kale claims that Chris hasn't even contacted her in two months about the baby or anything. Thing. I don't believe that that's true. In fact, I believe that Chris had been contacting her about their son, but Kale was upset that it was nothing about the relationship between the two of them and is trying to skew it in this way, specifically because she knows he won't go to the press or turn up on the show either. Remember, she does have a really long track record of lying, so it's tough to believe what she's saying here. She calls her friend Kristen and complains that Chris never even signed the birth certificate, and she also says that she's okay with him eventually getting 50-50 custody, which is weird because that is something that she rallies against wholeheartedly when it comes to Joe. We know that she has had a big issue with Javi going for 50-50 of Lincoln, but Javi was like, F you, I am getting 50-50 of my son. He's 50% me, child. Um, so it would be weird if two out of three baby daddies did wind up having 50-50 custody. Like, Joe, you really do have to man up here and take what's yours, which is an equal stake in your child's life. Now, let's talk about Janelle for a minute here. She and her family rent a cabin to get away to celebrate her birthday. And one of the first activities was ice skating, but for some reason, no one had helmets on. And I was scared SHIT list, especially when I saw poor Kaiser slipping over there. I almost 
almost like freaked out that his like head would crack in half or something. Ice is scary and it's really dangerous. Like even if you don't split your head open, you can get a serious concussion. David's birthday gift to Janelle was an Airbnb that he bought with her money and tickets to see Cardi B in concert also bought with Janelle's money. How funny is it that David didn't know that Kesha was one of Janelle's favorite singers? Like the whole world, Rihanna knows that Kesha is one of Janelle's favorite singers. Like, really, David? You don't know your wife as well as we do. We finally have a Chelsea scene worth talking about, but before we jump into it, does her friend Chelsea Grace have a job or is she paid to be Chelsea's shadow and driver? The two of them head over to court for a mediation session to find out, and they find out that Adam doesn't have a bank account, he doesn't have a car, he doesn't pay his bills, and he, uh, his home was already paid in full so that so like they can't garnish anything like that and he won't get a job because he claims to want to start a business even though he already said that he has no money and he's not even sure what his business is going to be about Adam you absolutely should not have quit MTV you really thought you were something high and mighty the way you treated everybody but I'm sure if they offered you five dollars a day you would come running back because your life is in the absolute shitter how astounding is it that someone who is making like hundreds of thousands of dollars for years is somehow flat broke like how did you not invest a single anyway now it's a twins birthday and uh, they decide to host the party at the arcade and leah talks about how jeremy's been creeping in the dms and hopefully it's to advise her to tan her hands alongside her face she feigns ignorance about his intentions when her sister knows what it is and hints at the fact that Jeremy is probably just creeping in the DMs to get them draws again. Back in Florida again, Brianna calls Javi after working and it's as awkward as pretending to be in a relationship with your brother would be. Guys, I am so jealous of Nova's hair, but she broke my heart when she said that she wouldn't miss Brianna going back to work because she feels like Brianna doesn't like taking care of her as much as she likes taking care of her younger sister, Stella. Um, Roxanne assures Nova that everyone in the family loves taking care of her and Nova takes the opportunity to drag her cursing ass TT Brittany. She's like, uh-uh, not my TT. That bitch is lazy, Grandma. And Grandma positively agreed. What does Brittany do for work, you guys? It's like the teen mom girls keep this court system in business single-handedly. Like, they waste so much money on lawyers and stuff. Anyway, Kale comes out of the court and recaps her friend on what went down you know she says that chris wound up getting supervised visitation why it's supervised is beyond me because he doesn't have any sort of record and he doesn't really like you know do anything that i or anyone else should really be concerned about that we know of anyway but whatever and kale complains that the supervisor is going to be an aunt of his and not a neutral party which is quite weird because what does she mean a neutral party? Like this is a father hanging out with a son. What are you talking about? It should be as normal as possible for the child. So why not let the aunt supervise? And why is it even supervised in the first? You know what? I think it might've been um, Kale's domestic violence claims. You know how she does that when it comes to every single man? Um, I think that's probably what happened there. Guys, the way she was going on about the mediator, it sounded like she wouldn't have been happy unless she was appointed to be the mediator. Um, guys, by the way, how did Chris manage to swing visitation anyway without being on the birth certificate? Like, are you technically not the father unless you're on the birth certificate? I really do wonder what the tea is there. Now, back in the cabin rented for Janelle by Janelle's money, David is pissed off because the kids are being hyper and wants everyone to pack up and go home. Guys, they must have run out of their drug stash or something because these kids were acting normal from what I saw, with the exception of the doorbell ringing. I felt like that was like, oh, um, but even then, it's not really worth packing everybody up and heading all the way home and ruining a birthday trip over. Has anybody noticed that Janelle turns into barbecue Becky whenever like um, she notices that David is agitated with anything and she just wants to make him more and more pissed off and make everything as more, more dramatic than it needs to be. So for example, with the whole Nathan thing, the last time all he texted was, I hope you're okay because when you're okay, my child is okay. You're my child's mom. Hope you're okay. She goes, David, Nathan obviously still wants all of this. Look at this text look at this text blah, blah blah and obviously it turns into this big bs match and so whenever david is pissed off at the kids she goes and snitches on the kids like david look at the kids you told them not to do that guess what they're doing david that 
all the time. She literally always wants to get everybody in trouble with David and it's so weird and creepy. Anyway, like clockwork, David is really pissed off at everything, including the fact that their toddler, not even like she, their newborn, Ensley, accidentally dropped a sock on the way. Like it, it was ridiculous, okay? Like what is she going to do? She's not even one years old at that point. And so he packs everybody up in the van and is like, get these cameras off. We're not going anywhere because these effing kids ruined it. And when he thinks the camera's off, he swears at all these children. I feel so bad for these kids. He's like, are you happy? You ruined everything. Acting like bleep, bleep, bleep. And at the very end, he realizes that there's still one camera on. And so the final scene of that is him being like, <laughs> that guy is scary. I cannot imagine what those kids go through. Like literally, what is he, 6'3", 6'4", screaming at you like that over nothing all the damn time? When you're going on a tirade like that and literally swearing at them and they're what, eight, three years old? Uh, there's like a less than a one-year-old there and then you've got a daughter who's like 11 or 12 and earlier in the episode The kids were being all innocent asking you about swear words what counts as bad words and not and Daddy's over here cursing at us like we're some strangers off the street Absolutely wrong and it just goes to show you how trash these people are I tell you now as we wrap up the episode we head back over to Florida where grandma Roxanne decides to snitch on sweet innocent Nova in front of everybody So the whole family is in the apartment living room and Roxanne's like Brianna earlier I was talking to Nova and she told me that um, she wasn't gonna miss your ass when you head back to work Because you only care about taking care of Stella. How sad is that? Nova is such a shy, sweet girl, and so I feel like things like this should be handled more maturely and away from her. Like, this is a serious concern. It's not like a casual, flippant thing that you do. Like, you're supposed to evaluate the situation and go back and figure out how you could change, you know, the way you treat her sub subtly so that Nova doesn't feel like she can't go to her grandma or anybody. And now I feel like they're reinforcing the fact that they're untrustworthy to this poor girl who really needed a shoulder to hear her out about how she feels about her mom and I feel like they weren't even going to do anything about it so why even like go bring that up in front of her? it was just ridiculous I was really disappointed in the way that Roxanne handled that now in the final scene of the episode at the twins party again um Jeremy tells Leah that he needs her to call him and so Leah runs on out of that party thinking she's about to get a booty call and so she calls Jeremy and she's like <laughs> Jeremy, you want this pussy back? And no, he's like, you know what, Leah, I just want to apologize to you about the way I spoke about you a couple of seasons ago. I said I didn't regret Addie, but I regretted having her with you. And that's been eating me up for a long time, and I feel really bad. You saw a range of emotions in Leah here. First of all, she was disappointed that this was not a DICK appointment, but she was grateful that he on camera wanted to apologize for the way he treated her, which was, you know, what he should have done as the father of Addie. And so she goes, oh, thank you. And then he goes on about like how much she's improved. And I feel like that made Leah a little bit uncomfortable because remember, Leah always tried to run away from the fact that she was doing drugs, right? She wanted it to be like, oh, I've got anxiety and I've got stress, which she probably does have as well as doing drugs, but she wants us to think it was just those two things. And he really was like hammering it in. Like, you've done so much better. You've really improved. Like, you're not doing the things you were doing doing anymore like you're doing so much better she was like all right all right all right I got it damn thank you thank you so much for taking that back which is all great uh, but you can just tell that she her orange face and her white hand were disappointed that it wasn't a booty call all right you guys now that wraps up the 24th episode of this season of teen mom 2 and of course I am more excited to hear what you have to say about everything so please make sure to leave all of your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below and as usual we'll chat you can also like this video, subscribe for more. Feel free to share it with your friends as well and follow me across social media where I absolutely love chatting with you. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.